Good afternoon. My name is Grant Kramer, and this is going to be part one of a viticulture lecture series uh, of viticulture in northern Nevada. I'm going to start off with an introduction uh, and then go into why Nevada in this series, in this first part. Uh, so let me change the screen. This is uh, a lecture that I gave last year um, for a fermentation technologies course at Biotech uh, 401. Uh, but since I am retiring uh, in June of 2021, I will not be giving this lecture again. So to preserve the information, I am giving you uh, this lecture. Okay, so to begin with at first, uh, let's talk briefly about grapes and the history of grapes in the area. Uh, there are over 500 putative grapevine species in the world. Uh, grapevine comes from the family Vitaceae uh, and from the genus Vitus or Vitus, depending on what country you come from and how you pronounce it. Some of the important species in the world are Vitus vinifera, which is the European wine grape, uh, Vitus labrusca, which is a conquered grape, one in eastern USA, Vitus riparia, which uh, grows wild between Quebec and Texas, is often used as rootstock or a, in a breeding program to provide hybrid rootstocks. Vitus amurensis, uh, which comes from China uh, and into Russia, and then Vitus rotundifolia, which comes from the southeastern United States, Muscovy grape. In fact, there are some wild grapes growing in southern Nevada, which we're doing research on, which appears to be um, uh, a cross or hybrid of, of several species, but I don't have time to get into that in this lecture. So the history of viticulture. Uh, viticulture is the cultivation of grapevine, and that history goes back to uh, at least 9,000 years ago. Uh, wine grapes themselves, uh, as we know them, are thought to have originated in the southern Caucasia area, which is present day northern Turkey, northern Iraq, Azerbaijan, and, and Georgia. Grapes were introduced into California in the 1770s by Spanish missionaries, um, and this was a uh, mission variety only. The European varieties uh, that we know of today are introduced after the gold rush between the 1850s and 1880s into California. Um, and the first experimental vineyards were planted at the university farms in Davis, California, which at that time I believe was an extension of UC Berkeley. It was not a UC campus back in 1908. Uh, and there were extensive varietal trials by professors Emmerine and Winkler at UC Davis, or in, in Davis, uh, which um, they established the, the best varieties. The wine boom really didn't hit California until the 1960s. So, why are we interested in wine grapes? Well, for one thing, the wine industry is a rapidly growing market. Um, and some of these numbers are starting to get outdated already, but they're fairly relevant and fairly current. Um, California uh, had over $6.25 billion in grape sales, $40.2 billion in retail sales in 2018. And the number of wineries doubled in previous 10 years to 3,900. So that 6.25 billion is just in grape sales. When you add wine into the equation, the value of that grapes goes much, much higher. Washington had $2.1 billion in retail sales and has increased from approximately 19 wineries to 970 plus wineries since 1980. 
tripling in the last 10 years. In Colorado, wineries have increased from five wineries to 150 plus wineries since 1990, doubling in the last 10 years. And the number of wineries in Nevada, they're very small. Uh, we have about five, uh, although that's changing and uh, we are increasing in numbers. Uh, we have one of the lowest numbers of wineries in any state in the US, and that includes Alaska and Hawaii. So uh, I'm going to make some comparisons to Washington State because Washington State is perhaps the best model for Northern Nevada as far as environmental conditions and the potential for growing grapes. The first commercial scale vineyards uh, formed in the 1960s um, and it's taken this long but has now grown into perhaps the second largest state in the country in terms of growing grapes. There are 350 plus growers with over 60,000 acres. Approximately 41% of the grapes are white grapes and the other 59% other are red or black grapes, if you choose that term. Uh, they make red wine at any rate. Um, the leading white grape is Chardonnay. The leading red grape is Cabernet Sauvignon. So here's an important point, particularly from our perspective in Nevada. Uh, the estimated Washington state revenues for 2012 were about, for grapes was about $278 million. The winery re revenue was 1.5 billion. The tourism revenue was 1 billion. And wine related wages was another $1 billion. So the total economic impact to Washington State alone was approximately $4.8 billion eight years ago. That included state and local taxes paid of $67.9 million. And the annual growth rate of this, these revenues was about 8.5% per year since 2003. So if we look at those in, in, in a graphical form, we can see on this plot from 1980 here that uh, our, our vineyard level, number of wineries was very low. Um, and we see a rapid increase starting uh, just before, about halfway through the 1990s, and uh, an enormously escalating almost logarithmic scale increase in wineries. Uh, this was preceded by an increase in grape acreage, which is absolutely necessary for the wineries to exist. Uh, and this was the case that we'll have here in Nevada. So we have five wineries, but we need grapes to grow, or to be used by those wineries. And so it's very important that we have some viticultural background and expertise to how to grow grapes in Northern Nevada. So let's look at a couple of comparisons, both in Northern Nevada and Southern Nevada uh, to growing conditions. And then we'll stop um, this part one lecture after that. So Reno is pretty similar to Richland, Washington. Uh, and one of the measurements that we use is something called average growing degree days, which is adjusted specifically for, for grapes in this case, uh, for temperatures that are uh, above 50 degrees, which is uh, Fahrenheit, which is when uh, grapes actually start to grow. So if we look in um, St. Helena in California, uh, they have 3,600 growing degree days when I collected this data. That may be higher now. Napa, uh, which is in the southern part of the Napa Valley, uh, which is cooler because it's next to the San Francisco Bay area, or San Francisco Bay, is approximately 2,700 growing degree days. And Richland, uh, in the heart of the Washington State growing region, uh, is 
has about 3,000. Likewise, Reno has about 3,000 growing degree days. Uh, and Fallon, which is uh, just east of us, uh, has about 3,400 growing degree days. So we have conditions that um, allow us to grow grapes, uh, and that's improved significantly with global warming since about the year 2000. Uh, and I'll get back to that later. Uh, so one of the other aspects of our northern Nevada temperatures is that mid-summer, uh, say July, uh, our average temperatures are in the low 90s and our lows are have been down as low as the 50s but have been creeping up with global warming here in the last few years to about 60 degrees so that gives us a 30 to 40 degree temperature differential which is very very good uh, it's those cool nights that you want to have to produce quality fruit and we have very dry environment uh, with relative humidities at and even below 15% to as high as 30%, which really reduces our incidence of disease, our insect dam our insect pest uh, pressure. Uh, we pretty much only have had, at least in our experimental vineyard, a powdery mildew to any significant degree, which we can control with elemental sulfur. But climate is changing, as I mentioned. If we look at this uh, plot of growing degree days, uh, in the 1940s, we can see that Reno was extremely low at around 2000. This is really too low to grow grapes. And if we follow these dark black symbols across time here over the latter years, we see in 1980, sort of a gradual increase. And then by the year 2000, uh, we are up very elevated uh, to the point where we're about 3,000 growing degree days and pretty steady throughout those years with a slightly increasing temperature profile occurring. We look at Yakima, Washington um, in a comparative sense and rich in the purple and rich when in the light blue, aqua blue, we can see that with Richland, the temperatures are up around 3,000 and have sort of maintained themselves over the course of this period. As well as in Yakima, Washington, perhaps a slight increase occurring towards the end. So climate change is happening, but it's not happening everywhere. In some places, it's not changing. And in other places, it's getting warmer. And actually, on the California coast, it's predicted to be cooler because of the fog that will creep in along the coastline as the interior va central valley warms up. So there was a very interesting paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in 2013. It created some controversy. but they attempted to uh, use more than 20 climate models to predict climate change and model uh, these temperatures that using grapevine and grapevine physiology as a predictor of what would happen. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that grapevines are very sensitive to temperature and uh, are a good model for uh, looking at impacts of global climate change on global warming on uh, viticulture. And so what you see in this map are, um, world map, are regions uh, where, uh, the, where the climate um, is predicted to change. So in the red, we have what are, at the time that this paper was published in 2013, um, we have the current suitability uh, regions, uh, and you can see over here, the West Coast, I'm gonna come back and focus in on that in this area here. The light green uh, suitability retained um, for uh, greater than 50% 50, 50 of, of the area, 
And uh, what I want to mention is the light blue and the dark blue, where there's going to be suitability um, in the future here, as I'll show you in the next slide. So I zoomed in on the area around Reno, and I did my best to overlay um, locations uh, over this map. And so the red and green are suitable in 2000, and the blue will be suitable in 2040. So we see Reno smack dab and north of Reno towards Susanville smack dab in an area that was not considered suitable now, but by 2040 would be suitable. And there are a few areas outside and around Las Vegas which may also be suitable. But that's clearly already happening, as I showed you in the earlier slide, uh, with the ch changes in average growing degree days. However, average growing degree days are, are not the only factors to be considered. Another factor that one has to consider when looking for a site to grow grapes is also what the risk is for frost. So I did, um, many years ago, uh, uh, research on uh, the temperature of uh, the regions and the chances for what I call killing temperatures. And what I mean by this is that if the temperature should get down to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit and the, the, in the middle of winter, when they're in their deepest dormancy state, they're very likely to be killed. They might survive down to minus 15. But I use minus 10 as a cutoff here. Um, and I went to DRI, the Desert Research Institute, for much of this data, some of which was online, some of which was published in, um, uh, for the very old information, was published in, in journals or uh, books. Um, so let's look at this, Reno, Nevada, uh, for, uh, for the probability of having frost-free days, and I'm using 28 degrees here because I've observed that if the temperatures stay above 28 degrees in the spring, uh, the buds will survive that frost temperature. But once the temperature hits 28 degrees, the, front, front, the buds will be frosted and die. So what's the probability of getting 150 days, which would be a good length of period of time? You could grow grapes in as short as maybe 120 days. And I'm talking largely about Vitus vinifera here, although the, the hybrid species are also just as sensitive to frost as are the um, Vitus vinifera wine varieties. So there's a 60% probability there. The lowest temperature on record in Reno is minus 19. That's over 100 years ago. Um, the frequency that these killing temperatures occur for the last 100 years, and I've averaged this, is nine years. But the longest killing temperature free, killing temperature, killing temperature free interval for killing temperatures. The longest period has been 25 years. Uh, however, that's changing now as um, the last killing temperature we had was in 1990 and it's now 2020. So this should really be 30 years. This is getting outdated. Yarrington, a little bit southeast of here, uh, doesn't fare as well. And what we really should focus on more than anything here are the frequency of these killing temperatures because um, if you can't grow a vineyard for six years, you're, you're really not even making any profit for four years. You're not going to be able to sustain a vineyard if you're growing, uh, for, um, if you're having frost killing all your vines, all your fruit um, every six years. That's going to be very difficult for you to commercially make it. So we look at Yarrington and Fallon all in Nevada. They have poor um, frequencies, that is that they're lower uh, every six years or 6.1 years. We look at Washington though, Yakima, Washington has a fre killing frequency of every uh, 3.8 years. Um, 
And Grand Junction, Colorado, where they're also growing grapes, has a frequency every 4.8 years, yet they have viable wineries. So how are they able to do that? In part, because nobody has been getting killing temperatures lately. Again, product, I think, of global warming here since 1990. However, there are times in Fallon where they went in the 1950s for 23 years or something like that and didn't have a killing temperature. And then next three out of the five years they had were hit by killing temperatures. So you can't use this as a hard and fast rule of when you're going to get killing temperatures. Hence, as in all agriculture, it can be risky growing grapes in Nevada. Okay, more recently, I started to work with people in Las Vegas, which I had not focused on for most of my um, research. And I started to look at the potential and uh, growing green, grow, uh, the potential of growing grapes in, in, in the Las Vegas or Southern Nevada region. Uh, so initially, I again looked at uh, growing degree days. Uh, and Las Vegas is very high, it's up there at 7,300. Uh, this is near the airport uh, in Parump, uh, just to the north west of, uh, of Las Vegas, it's about 5,500. And if you compare this to Bakersfield, the, that's 5,800 in the Central Valley, and Fresno is 5,600, and they grow grapes in those areas. So. It is feasible to grow grapes, and there are grapes growing in Peru. Uh, one of the advantages, again, of Southern Nevada are that you have these um, big temperature differentials. Um, however, it can get very hot in, in those areas, and high temperatures uh, can cause a decrease in photosynthesis to the point where photosynthesis can completely shut down. So, uh, you want to try to avoid those high temperatures if you can. There are se selected sites that maybe have higher elevations uh, where climate could be cooler. And you hope to have grape varieties not uh, ripening in August or even July, but are late or delayed ripenings to the point where they could ripen in the fall where you're going to get cooler temperatures and good temperature differentials. And I'll speak more to that in the next lecture. So just uh, one final point here is that here at 3,800 feet next to Las Vegas and Summerlin, uh, the average growing degree days are quite a bit lower. And if we look at other regions in the world where grapes are being grown, um, we can see uh, Syracuse in Sicily, Italy is around 4,900, Naples is 3,800, Seville, Spain is 5,600, Granada is 3,800, and Santorini, where they've grown grapes for more than 2,000 years, uh, is 5,100. So it's not out of the um, um, imagination to think that, that grapes can be grown, and in fact, we have a plot down in Las Vegas um, in northern Las Vegas where we are uh, growing grapes. Um, and if we look to some of these regions for what varieties are growing in those areas, they may be better suited for the Las Vegas um, region than what we are growing in northern Nevada. Okay, so we'll talk about site selection in the next part. I'll end it here. And we'll talk to you soon.